Good evening. Konbangwa. <laughs> Wanan. Um, I'm Carol Brash, the Director of Asian Studies, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Frenchie Lenning, who is going to be sharing with us this evening the history of cosplay. And she recently um, published a book on this subject and is currently um, working on um, a book on shoujo, um, and some of you heard her talk about that earlier this afternoon. So without any further ado, since I'm starting a little bit late, my apologies, I'm going to uh, please help me welcome Dr. Frenchie Lenning to the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. Well, thank you everyone for being here. It's always a treat to um, speak to people who um, get what I like and don't think I'm an idiot. Um, so let me just, uh, well, it'll come back. There it is. Nope, it'll come back in a minute. There it is. Okay. So, um, so I am. Uh, yeah, sure, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to talk um, about um, the history of cosplay. Uh, when I started writing the book on cosplay, which I was asked to write by the publisher, um, I was like, oh, okay. Um, and I started, you know, when you write something like that, you want to sort of include a history so that people have some kind of foundation in what you're going to talk about, right, and sort of the theoretical aspects. But there was none. I looked everywhere, and I realized that all there was were these little bits of you know, commentary, um, things that people had seen, and all this kind of stuff. So I started looking, and it's taken about five years to get what I have um, ready. And so you're going to hear, this is, um, I'm going to read it only because there are so many dates and times and stuff that I can't keep in my head. Um, so I hope you um, will um, not be too bored with like a, I know that pe people like a spontaneous thing. I'm going to be spontaneous at times, but I'm going to read it so that I can actually um, uh, get you the actual facts here. So these two guys um, were at MarsCon in about 2012, um, and uh, they are friends, and they decided to become po cosplayers. And they were not, they're in their 60s, and they are um, not unusual, actually, in um, cosplay anymore. So history writing is ever tied to the fragment. The known facts are scattered broadcast like stars across the firmament. It should not be assumed that they form a coherent body in the historical night. This is Marshall McLuhan talking about the, the fragility of history in the sense that uh, we tend to think of a history you know, in terms of texts in which everything is written out and there is no deviation and so forth. But in point of fact, of course, history is this very fragile, very uh, uh, sort of based on many different kinds of points that people have gotten word of mouth or from texts or, or from suppositions and so forth. It's a very complex thing, history. It's not an easy thing. And writing this was very difficult because there are overlaps, there are um, innuendos, there are um, linkages, and you'll see as I go through that, I'll explain to you things that I found and what I was able to find and what I couldn't find and so forth. So um, we'll just get started here. So um, attempting to write about any popular cultural object is fraught with what are, in the age of the internet, unique problems of lack of leader scholarship, leadership too, but scholarship, lack of citations, and a lack of veridical, veridical evidence, not to mention several conflicting dates, urban legends, random hearsay, online rumors, and mysterious events. This rings true for most, popular, uh, most postmodern popular cultural objects, but especially for cosplay, as the entire set of social behaviors from costume creation to performances and posing for the cameras is all to be experienced on the internet, without which the practice would not have created the massive amount of cosplaying activities it is now associated with. Cosplay itself is not a singularity, despite its seemingly simple and frequently denigrated status as a contemporary fun hobby for adolescents and some adults. It is, in fact, 
a very complicated constellation of habits, obsessions, desires, gender experimentation, creativity, performance, and the representation of a panoply of disparate identities, real and fictional. It is both simultaneously an individual occupation and a group social phenomenon of vast numbers and frequency. Consequently, the cultural explanation or history of cosplay is a broad and complex set of practices and desires that are difficult to reduce to a single concept. Even if we're able to link together a series of vignettes, stories, or events in a sort of chronological order, yet the very nature of these events defies a totalizing order. As, prior, as prioritizing events and orders are highly subjective in cosplay with sketchy or, or no accredited scrutiny and things tend to change very rapidly. But what is cosplay? Even in with the many otaku, I think I've jumped a little thing here, there we go. Um, but what is cosplay? Even with many otaku, there is a confusion as to what actually constitute cosplay, as opposed to other forms of costume play, practiced both historically and contemporarily. Actual cosplayers, on the other hand, have very strict parameters concerning the meaning and practice of cosplay. So the, from the most conservative to the most inclusive cosplayers, we might define cosplay as the performance featuring a costume enactment of a character from popular culture. More succinctly, the costumes of cosplay are created through a passionate love and an intense identification with a popular cultural character, wherein the goal is not to produce and perform a character to complete a narrative for the audience experiencing a theatrical narrative, but for the individual fan subject to embody and identify with an adored character whose persona is real for the actor of the cosplay costume. The creation of the costume is as much a part of the community-based aspect of fandom as it is the actual performance. This separates the cosplayer from their roots in costume history as a distinct practice with its history to be found in the advent of popular cultural media expansion and the consequent development of the fan. The concept of popular culture as the founding origin that produced the practice of cosplay begins with the notion of a mass society formed during the late 19th century as a result of the industrialization and urbanization of Europe through changes in labor, industrial organization, the development of dense urban populations, the development of emerging technical communication systems, and the growth of mass political movements. The 19th century industrial laborers worked long hours, but the close access to the urban distractions of theater, opera, literature, and eventually art and education enabled them to enjoy these entertainments and engage in hobbies, crafts, and recreation outside their work lives. The most influential entertainment was to be found in the publishing industries. With mass production of cheap, throwaway fictional narratives that took the form of newspapers, paperback books, magazines and journals, and newspaper strip comics, these stories commonly referred to as pulp stories also created stereotypical characters who were predictable in terms of their behavior and profile. Inexpensive and easily accessible to large, uneducated society, these pub, uh, pulp media became a massive industry that de uh, disseminated these short, cheap, formulaic narratives with their stereotypical characters in historic proportions. It was not long before these characters became known popularly throughout the world. Thus, in the 20th century, early in the 20th century, we find what is often purported to be the first recorded incidence of cosplay, Mr. Skygak of Mars was cosplayed by Mr. William Fell attending a 1908 masquerade event. His popular cultural source was a comic strip considered to be, considered to be the first science fiction comic called Mr. Skygat Goes to Mars, or From Mars, sorry. Created by A.D. Kondo for the Chicago Day Book, a working class newspaper published from 1907 to 1917 in both comic strips and single panel cartoons. 
Apparently, the attendees of a masked skating carnival were delighted by William Fell's Skygak costume. He appeared alongside his wife, dressed as Diana Dill Pickles, another character from the same author. The practice of cosplaying Mr. Skygak expanded around the country, but was not always appreciated. In March of 1910, the front page of the Tacoma Times informed readers, Mr. Skygak is in jail. A man named Otto James in a borrowed Skygak costume was arrested and fined $10 for violating laws against masquerading in public. Later at a mask ball in Monroe, Washington in 1912, August Olson's impressive homemade Skygak costume, complete with notebook, won him first prize and a place on the front page of the local newspaper, and he even went to jail for it. Also in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we find women's Shakespearean study groups popping up all over the United States, from Worcester, Mass, to Waxahachie, Texas, some 500 of them in the peak years of 1880 to 1940. They would recite passages, perform characters, and dress the part. Shakespeare is not ordinarily considered a popular cultural literature, and yet performed by common working people, soldiers, and school children all over the United States, as it was at that time, positions his work as popular cultural objects. Yet if we abide by the decision to confine the larger contemporary definition of cosplay performance to be a costumed enactment of a character from a popular cultural uh, object, we must also address the seminal importance of the science fiction convention as it developed in the first half of the 20th century. Science fiction conventions were, and are, usually annual gatherings of fans of various forms of speculative fiction, including science fiction and fantasy usually at hotels or convention centers in large urban areas. We find that the first generally accepted cosplay proper to be also the first documented costume citation as opposed to the masquerade performance and was performed by Forrest Forey Ackerman at the 1939 Worldcon in Philadelphia, which was also the first Worldcon convention. Ackerman was the originator of the science fiction fandom. He printed Ray Badbury's first story in 1938, and in 1954, he coined the term sci-fi. His costume was nonspecific in terms of character, but reflected the futuristic space military, char military characters in the illustrations found in science fiction comic books and magazines of the time. In Britain, the Leeds chapter of the Science Fiction Lead of 1937 also claimed to be the first science fiction convention. Held in Leeds, the main order of business was setting up the Science Fiction Association, the UK's first national science fiction organization. Ron Holmes recalls that, Roy Johnson and I had never met, but we were both swordsmen of a sort, so it seemed a good idea to have a bout. We were about to, we were to enact a scene from Warlord of Mars, he to be John Carter and I to be Tars Tarkas. And this is a cover from the book that they are talking about. However, Feldman suggests that in the US, the first documented masquerade was Worldcon 1950, hosted by Norwestcon. Established the tradition of staged masquerade contests by involving the presentation of costumes for the purpose of award. I did not find that documentation, but there was a costume ball which Fan Cyclopedia equates with the masquerade. So this is another thing where there's two sort of uh, competing uh, theories about, not theories, but uh, sort of um, statements about what actually happened there. So uh, the original Star Trek TV drama um, which went from 1966 to 1969, was clearly the first science fiction true mass popular narrative to provoke their own conventions. The first fan convention devoted the, to the show occurred on the 1st of March of 1969 at the Newark Public Library, although Francesca Coppa suggests it occurred later in New York City in 1972. And also, uh, one of the first mentions of the cosplay phenomenon that would inspire the larger movement. 
quote, in 1967, science fiction editor Arthur W. Saha applied the term Trekkies when he saw a few fans from the first season of Star Trek, the original series, wearing pointy ears at the 25th World Science uh, Fiction Convention. Star Trek blazed the trail for the new sort of science fiction fandom that now included more women for the first time. Women were interested less in the technical hard science fiction of earlier predominantly male science fiction fans and more interested in character and narrative and became the first media fandom, hence its name, the mother fandom, and that's what they call Star Trek. It was also, uh, may have been the first time that a Japanese woman, fun, uh, funda, Funado uh, Makiko, attending the 25th World Con Science Fiction Convention mentions the incidents of Americans cosplaying characters from Japanese literature. She states, the next highlight of the convention was the costume parade. This parade had so much more variety than the fashion show and it was much more entertaining because of the interactive aspect. It was followed by the description of the parade where Lynn Carter cosplayed as one of the characters from Kurahashi Yumiko's Head of Apollo. As the 1960s became the 1970s, recreations of popular media characters began to creep into both hall costuming and stage uh, masquerade costumes. This includes anime. As one attendee noted, there were nerds getting their hands on Japanation, which is the term that we used for um, anime in the 1990s. Still using the term costume show, however, were the two uh, Japanese visitors to the 1973 Worldcon Torcon site. The costume show on the second night of the convention was the highlight of the event for everyone. Fans from all over America and their elaborate costumes made us want to cheer for them. And all of a sudden, there was some laughs along with some applause. When we looked towards the sound, there was a battle between a person who had a saucer on his head dressed as the spaceship Enterprise from Star Trek and another dressed as the Enterprise's nemesis, the Klingon ship. But most talked about the award of was Lynn Carter's Ice King from Ice King of Crystal, for which resemblance was uncanny. Now, look carefully at this photo because this is from the same thing, the 1973 Torcon, but that woman ha doesn't have a shirt on. She is nude, at t uh, bare-breasted. Now, I found nothing. I hunted for a long time looking for any kind of mention of this. There's nothing mentioned about it at all. All I can figure is that maybe we're not seeing that there's actually costume over, that, over those breasts or something, but it was pretty shocking um, to see this. Uh, so, However, once anime began to appear in many places in the United States in the late 1980s, fans began to arrive uh, at Star Trek conventions in anime costumes, appearing first at the San Diego Comic Con convention in 1979. It is suggested that Karen Dick, a regular on the cosplaying scene of that time, was indeed the first American anime cosplayer, playing Captain Harlock for the Hall contests in 1979, and in 1980, entered the Starship Yamato group for the Masquerade at Worldcon and other conventions on the West Coast. But Karen Dick clarifies. She says, I belonged to my college Star Trek club and had been going to Star Trek conventions in the San Diego Comic Con since 1973. It didn't take long for me to look at Star Blazers with my costumer's eye and see uniforms with clean lines and bright colors that could be reproduced easily in inexpensive double nick fabric. I made the first two in the fall of 1979 for Terry and myself. I guess, I think that's her partner. Then we discovered other anime series set in the Legiverse, which we hadn't seen yet, Captain Harlock, Queen Esmeraldas. Terry felt an immediately, immediate affinity with the brooding Captain Harlock and I with Esmeralda. By spring of 1980, those costumes were part of our repertoire. In 1980, San Diego-based groups Captain Harlock and Star Blazers descended upon the masquerade of the Science Fiction Weekend Convention in Los Angeles and won both major awards. So that's her account. I'm pretty sure this is her. This is another photograph that it took me a long time to find. Um, she's on the 
far left there and then her partner Terry is in the middle. It looks like her, it looks like Terry, but there was no attribution to this image at all. But you can tell from the sort of the state of the, the photograph and so forth that this is highly possible that this is who it is. Later, um, at the eight, 1981 Worldcon in Denver, the first standardized judging rules were instituted as a three-tiered skill division applied to workmanship. It was the first time that the panels on costuming began to develop a great deal of interest. And as a result, the first costume con was held in 1983 and the formation of the International Costumers Guild in 1985. In Japan, Kamiket had also began to comment on costume play. Found in a 1982 Kamiket catalog, a section of the organizer's page mentioned Kamiket is where the start of the term costume play began to appear and was the event cosplay was seen by the media the most. One of the, most, one of the possible reasons is Ban Ipoji, Iponji, a future manga artist dressed as Ramu from Urusei Yatsura by Rumiko Takahashi at the event. She had a wardrobe malfunction and one of her breasts were shown by accident. This incident was told by Ban Iponji manga, Dojin Girl JB. Um, ban Iponji is one of the members of Japan's Sci-Fi Writers Club, so she's fairly famous. This is what she's talking about. Now what is interesting is, is that again, this is uh, Echi. Right, so it's very um, um, interesting inside, but I decided not to show you those pages, right? So, about the same time in Japan, the Japanese word cosplay, or cosplay in English, was introduced in a magazine called My Anime in 1983. I contacted Nov Takahashi and got this straight because I found so much, so many urban legends told about Nov Takahashi and the discovery of this word or the invention of this word. So I finally just contacted him and he, um, this is what he answered back. Uh, in June of 1983, a magazine called My Anime was published by Akita Shoten. In that magazine, an article called Costume Play was published. The author was, of the article was Takahashi Nobuyuki of Studio Hard Inc and his friends from Waseda University, Yoshikoka Hitoshi and Machiyama Tomohiro. The word costume play didn't sound appropriate in English, so after a lot of revising, the article was called Operation Cosplay. And there it is. And you'll see that in English, it's still hero costume operation, but if you look at the katakana, you can see that he had changed it by that time. So one of the great fan legends around the beginnings of Japanese cosplay has to do with the discussion of the wonderful Japanese feminist science fiction author, critic, and cosplayer Kotani Mari, and the urban legend that she was the first cosplayer in Japan. Kotani has clarified now uh, what is now understood to be a case of mistaken identity. Kotani performed in the masquerade of the 17th Japan Science Fiction Convention, Ashinokan, which took place on August 1978, where anime could be found as a presence only in the screening rooms. Kotani was dressed as the character Tavia from the sci-fi story, A Fighting Man from Mars um, by Edgar Rice Burroughs, imitating this transvestite heroine in the beautiful color illust cover illustration of the Japanese edition. However, convention attendees thought Kotani was playing a similar appearing manga character, Triton of the Sea, from a work of the same name by Tezuka Osamu, thus encouraging those attendees to later cosplay as their favorite anime characters, and consequently establishing the practice at Japanese conventions. So although her intention was not to portray an anime character, yet the stunning effect of her mistaken appearance as a cosplayer of anime did indeed position her as the first Japanese cosplayer, albeit a case of mistaken identity. Uh, this is Mari. She uh, just uh, last year received a Hugo Award for her work in um, science fiction, both as a cosplayer, as a critic, as a writer. Um, she's done a tremendous amount of work, and um, so she's there she is as a much older woman. There is a copy of this uh, image that will be in the actual book, but I haven't gotten it yet, so we do with this. 
So by the late 1980s and the early 1990s, the convention as a site for fan practices and adulation had proliferated rapidly through the United States, Europe, and Asia. The 1990s also brought in various digital media sources to bear on the practices of cosplay, allowing for more sophisticated documentation and radically faster global distribution with the result that major cosplay events are now held in at least 35 countries, including Singapore, France, Portugal, Spain, Belgium, Poland, Germany, Denmark, Switzerland, Netherlands, Brazil, United States, Italy, the Philippines, Taiwan, mainland China, and Indonesia. Most cosplay events follow a similar pattern of growth. By the early 2000s, the prevalence of these massive anime conventions occurring around the globe began to suggest a new possible category of international cosplay event, which indeed came in 2003 in Nagoya, Japan, with the first World Cosplay Summit. But Widya Santoso, who is a guy who was uh, sort of key in a lot of these founding uh, conventions and was one of my most uh, fertile uh, informers as to this early history, um, he states that he believes the international competition started in South America, in Brazil, in about 2001 with the now International Yamato Cup. In the early international convention, many South American cosplayers participated in the event. Then, in 2002, inspired by how the Japanese otaku culture was celebrated in other countries than Japan itself, a group of cosplayers in Japan, including the charismatic MC Edmund Edo Hoff and others, created a World Series for international cosplaying. Through a series of heats in their own countries, cosplayers now perform an intense competition to achieve a place in the summer celebration that is the World Cosplay Summit. Um, so uh, I'll go back here. This is uh, act, this image was taken in 2016, which is when I was in um, Noria to see this this thing happen. And the entire city comes to a halt. They make uh, the all of the arcades are have streamers. The entire city comes out. They all cosplay or they wear traditional clothes. Um, there's a huge parade that goes through the entire. There's a whole like a. Uh, like a snaking version of a street going through the town. They have a big um, festival and they do prizes. They award all the prizes in front of the entire town, which is like standing out in front of this dais. It's pretty impressive. So through the 1990s and into the 2000s, the expansion of cosplay um, in the uh, individual European countries had been fairly strong, but until recently there had not been an event that encompassed Europe as a whole until 2010, when a new event called ECG, or European Cosplay Gathering, emerged with 11 countries taking part, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. Further, the Asian Cosplay Meet emerged, hosted by the Singapore Cosplay Club as the Asian Cosplay Meet Championship since 2010, and participating countries include Philippines, Japan, China, Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and Taiwan, and will be including Vietnam in the future. This rapidly expanding number of conventions has been flourishing as the internet expands, transmitting a wealth of conference information and images through email lists, digital cameras and phones, blogs, tweets, and websites have all contributed to an increase in the visibility of the work and art of cosplay. As a result, this increasing portfolio of cosplay and its associated ever innovating practices have added to the framework of the performance aspect of cosplay, from one of only a performance on a stage in the masquerade and hall contest to one of posing for cameras and posting as semi-professional and professional cosplay models on the internet. Cosplayers at conventions can now include professional cosplayers to be hired to pose for cameras. In the latest evolution of cosplay, small local conventions continue to expand to university campuses, libraries, and schools, widening the practice and the population of cosplayers to the mainstream more and more, 
We can only guess the changes that will evolve in the future. Thank you. So I was at RodCon, this uh, event, that's my photograph there, um, and this is the, um, the, the cosplayers that were there. There were 1,300 people in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, cosplaying. It's an amazing number. And it was, of course, the Dalek that won because this guy even had the right sound this, and the, the, he got the right voice and everything. And he was so cool. And he kept going and saying naughty things to people as he was going through the crowd and so forth. It was a lot of fun. Okay, so do you have any questions? I'm sure you do. I'm a moment to think. How many are cosplayers in this audience? One? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, so I know you said you didn't find a lot on this when you were looking for this, so you had to basically write your own research report. I was wondering how you uh, got into this field and what intrigued you the most initially. That's a, a good story, uh, a, a good idea, because, uh, you know, I, when I got my PhD, I wrote my dissertation on American comics, because that's really what I was interested in, right? Um, and after that was done, um, I decided to go for a Fulbright because I had a sabbatical coming up, and I thought, well, what do I want to do? I should go to Japan because that was one of the places that was open for a Fulbright. And I love Japan, I've always been interested in it, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought, well, I should do drawings. I should get some kind of drawings. I'll do manga, right? Um, natural. So I, um, I wrote it and I got it and I went to Japan the first time, and this was in 2008. And uh, I've always liked this stuff, but in, in Japan at that time were far more, of course, manga than we ever got here, right? I mean, just huge amounts of manga. And so uh, at one point, I'm going through this trying to sort of figure out what I could focus on. I mean, obviously, you, if I could write the history of manga, but I didn't really have the scope for that, and my Japanese is very poor, so I couldn't really do that well, I didn't think. So I was uh, in um, a um, book-off, with, um, which is a big discount used manga store. And uh, I was with a friend and I was uh, looking around and I found Comic Chana Karan. And I opened it up and I was like, what is this? And it was an extreme shoujo, extreme shoujo. And so, uh, I mean, there was no panels. There were uh, flowers and feathers and, you know, these page after page of these intense drawings and so forth. So that it was very hard to read the the narrative, you couldn't sort of figure out what was going on. And I was turned to my friend and said, what is this? And he said, that's shoujo. That's the real shoujo, not just the sort of tame stuff we got in the United States at that time. And I said, that's what I want to do. So I started studying from that point on, uh, specifically on shoujo. Cosplay came into it because um, I've also written in fashion. I have another book on fetish and fashion that, again, I was asked to write for a, a publisher. Um, and I've always been a fashion follower and stuff like that, um, not in terms of my dress, mind you, but you know, in terms of interest. So that's how I got into it. And the cosplay thing, when it was the same publisher that did that, I did the fetish fashion things uh, for, asked me to do this cosplay book, and so that's how it happens. And now, then I became much more involved in uh, that stuff. I'd always seen a lot of anime. I was I was a basically a real anime fan. I started the anime club at our college and stuff, but I, I hadn't really gotten into manga to that extent until I, I found out what it really was like, right, in Japan. But that's how I got into it. I sort of fell into like a rabbit hole, basically. Yeah. Anybody else? Hi. I, Hi. I'm Jeff Dubois. I teach Japanese literature here. So I've been told. Uh, and I'll have lunch with you tomorrow, and I look forward to it. Yeah. Um, so, Jap, um, I'm guessing that many cosplayers will make a clear distinction between what they are doing and what is not cosplay, beyond maybe just um, your definition of, of emulating 
a character from popular culture. Right. And so they'll be able to identify precise like aesthetic elements that yes. make them cosplayers and make um, other people, I don't know, just the occasional Halloweener or something. That's right, yeah. And so I'm wondering what those features are, and are they adjectives, or is it the participation in the community or something else? Sure. Well, here's the thing. They, um, and I've talked to a whole bunch of them, both in Japan and here, and then the, the uh, Cosplay World Summit, I talked to almost all of those guys. Um, for them, cosplay is distinctly anime and manga. Um, they, there's, of course, you know, if you go to any cosplay event, there's Harry Potters and Sherlock Holmes, and I mean, there are many other popular cultural things there. But they don't consider, the hardcores don't consider that cosplay it's proper, right? Mm. Um, what they, their whole, their whole reason of being, the way they talk about cosplay, it's not just uh, costuming and playing a character, it's being the character. Um, they, they try to envelop themselves into the character of the, cause, of the character that they're playing. Um, and it, it means that the costume has to be as close as possible. It means that they have to memorize these lines so that literally they can inhabit the lines for the masquerade. Um, they travel in their troupe basically because they get like minds and so forth. Um, but there's a lot of snobbery in terms of, you know, who's really a cosplayer and who isn't. Um, so that's why I said between these conservative and very hard-nosed people and between the sort of the casual cosplayer who does do Harry Potter, right, I, that I put it together to just be a kind of common carrier of this kind of stuff. In the book I talk more about this because uh, the, the cosplayers are very adamant about this. And it's interesting too because the Lolita is a kind of an associated costume play kind of thing from Japanese origin are the same way. You know, the kind of Lolita you are is really specific. I gave a talk on um, the history of Lolita that I had gotten from Takimoto Nobala. Um, we talked at length about this. And uh, this young Lolita was like taking me to the mat for every single <laughs> thing, right? And I said, well, I. I can't say you're wrong. All I can say is this is what you know the guy who basically invented it said, right? Um, so it's uh, I think part of it is is that people who come under fire for what they do because for their their art probably get pretty testy about it and um, try to keep that shell up by having strict rules about things so that their their identity is protected in a way, their their art is protected. I think that's why it happens that way. It's usually people who are very much into this and are sick and tired of being made fun of. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, did that? Yeah, 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 yeah. no, yeah. thank you. The other thing I just wanted to mention is in the past, at least in the past four years, two Asian Studies capstone students, uh, Asian Studies students have written their capstone on various issues of cosplay, and they happen to be very hardcore yep. cosplayers, and we're from the Hmong community in St. Paul. And what they tell me is that St. Paul actually has a very sort of thriving cosplay scene. They do. And uh, yeah, I find that very interesting and wonder yes. if you have any inter interaction with them as well. You know, I've had um, just the barest interaction with them. Um, they, um, there is in St. Paul, um, once a year they have a kind, there's a Japanese garden in the conservatory that we have in the, one of the parks. And so they have a, uh, the Japanese society uh, does, you know, a, a, an event, right, where people can like, you know, sell things and, you know, eat Japanese food or what passes as Japanese food. And there's a tea house there. So you can have tea house, there's a master there. And so you can take, you know, get an appointment to do tea house lessons and stuff like that. And those, um, those women show up for that. Um, they, um, they're called the Ruffle Butts. That's their name. Um, <laughs> I've met them. They're very cordial to me. They see me as a total outsider, which, you know, well, really I am. I'm not a Lolita. But my association with Samantha Ray, who is a, li a lifestyle Lolita designer, she was in Project One Way last year. Um, she's very good. She's sold internationally. People from Japan buy her stuff. So because of my association with her, they were nice to me, I think, and didn't tell me what a hoax I was or anything, you know. 
But I mean, they're very, they're very strict. And they told me that it's, you know, it's like it, certain, if you're going to call yourself a sweet Lolita, certain kinds of dress, certain kinds of slips are only acceptable. So they're very much about the minutia in the, in the, in the way you wear your hair, what, what you do with your hands, you know, what you, what you put on your feet, everything is, it's very well called out, and apparently, what they told me was is that if you think we're mean, you should go on the internet because mm -hmm. those girls are really mean. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I showed her somebody back there wanted something. Mm -hmm. Young. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I was going to ask. Um, like you showed us in uh, Northern Iowa, there's a large number of people um, cosplaying there in San Diego. Um, I know there's a huge, yeah, the Comic-Con oh is huge yeah, there. I was going to ask, um, uh, in Japan, I know anime and manga are really huge. In the US, it kind of seems like it's not like as much as it is in Japan and uh, some parts of Asia. Um, do you see maybe um, a rise in the amount of uh, literature produced and uh, the amount of entertainment produced like in manga and form and anime in the US and vice versa. Um, if you think in Japan, did you see any of um, more of the writing styles and like art that is produced here, like like Marvel heroes and such like that? There, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing because um, Japanese are very interested in, in American things. Um, they don't, um, there are um, American comic books over there in Japanese, um, but they're not r widely, uh, it's, not, it's, not hard, it's not easy to find them, right? Um, but they're influenced by them in, to certain degrees. Uh, they do talk about it. Uh, I know scholars uh, tend to talk about it, and there are some scholars who, who specialize in talking about the American stuff between it. Um, in the past years since I've been there, there's been a, um, a sea change in the kinds, the ways in which people get manga, right? It used to be that you bought stuff uh, or you w read this, watched the scanlations, right? You went on scanlation. Well, more and more it's showing up on Crunchyroll, right? Uh, and other sort of uh, online uh, legit um, formats. And people still buy books uh, and so forth, but not on the scale that they did. Um, it's kind of cooled down here. I think, in many ways. Cosplaying, on the other hand, has sped up. It's interesting because the cons that I used to go to used to be more about the panels talking about, you know, fights about different anime or, you know, what's shoujo, what's not. Um, but now they're, they're basically cosplay events and that the whole, the whole meaning is waiting for Saturday night for the masquerade, right? Or at least that's been the, my experience is that, that it, the cosplayers have kind of even just sort of usurped a great deal of the, the energy from the American conventions. In Japan, I only went to one event at comic Hut, and it was, a, it was, a, uh, it was a, just for uh, manga circles, for the doujin circles. It wasn't the full comic Hut. And so, um, and it was packed, right? Um, and everybody was in cosplay costumes, right, the people who were selling the doujin. So it was kind of interesting because I think that there's a way in which cosplay is becoming more lifestyle there and it's becoming much more sort of like formalized here. And these conventions are sort of taking over the, the thing. But, you know, we don't roam parks and stuff. We stay in those hotels. We don't go into the city like they do, right? Um, in Japan, they have these, I, w I went to one in a park in uh, Tokyo, a huge one in the park in Tokyo. Some of these images are from that. Do you see the little girls in front of the merry-go-round? That was from that park. Amazing, right? Um, so there's a lot of changing going on right now, I think. I think the internet has a lot to do with it. I think just the, the way that trends move in literature, in anime and stuff, I mean, anime has become much more about fan service than it used to be about more stories, you know. It's much more that kind of thing than it used to be the, like the very original stories and the very, you know, incredibly done, incredibly wrought. Um, and then you have Ghost in the Shell with Scarlett Johansson. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just a problem for me. Um, I mean, we have a lot of Japanese and Asian actresses that could definitely do that role, but we get Scarlett Johansson, who does not look at all Japanese. But I think, um, I think we're in a, a real uh, moment of change 
in terms of not only the literature, but also the, the fandoms are switching over because fandoms are becoming the big focus now. It's then, we, then lots of the studies, the academic studies are on fan studies. So it's, it's funny what's happening now. It's funny you should bring that up because it's a real, it's very hard to explain. This is just a kind of, there's a melee happening in the sea change, right? This is the scary row here, right? Well, an easy one. <laughs> you, you know, you talked about really how cosplay evolved itself. It's really at a place of transition. Yeah. Um, how about the reception side? The, you know, the mainstream, have they viewed it differently now? Well, it's interesting because at this, uh, oh, let's see if I can go back here. Uh, at this event, the RodCon thing, I mean, this is a small uh, event. There were families, which they're almost, almost never, I've seen in anime conventions, like in the big hotel conventions. You'll see them once in a while, but not very often, right? They're mostly young people, right, in, in the big hotels. This is families, old people. There was an old guy, you know, in a sort of, uh, I don't know what he was cosplaying, frankly, but he was in a costume. Um, and there was lots of older people. There were lots of young people. Uh, lots of different kinds of people, and it was just a kind of a, a, you know, Cedar Falls is just an Iowa town with a university in it. So there were a lot of university students in it and so forth. But people had driven in from other cities, or what I was told, from other towns around uh, Cedar Falls to go to this thing. Because 1,300, I don't even know that Cedar Falls has that many people in it, right? Probably without the students, they don't. Um, but it was, uh, I, think it's, I think that reception has changed. It has become acceptable and fun to do it, right? Because cosplaying is fun. Um, at the sort of professional level that we were talking about, the professional cosplayers, they have become really professional. There's a wonderful woman named Peggy Sim. I include a lot of her images in there, and she's a professional cosplay uh, model and does cosplay, you know, is sort of for photography alone, and this is where a lot of those really uh, dedicated cosplayers go, is to the photography, because then the photographer will set up, you know, like scenes and so forth that's, that's happening. Uh, her work is really probably some of the best I've seen, and that's really popular in Europe, especially, um, that that's happening, but also in, um, in Japan, the, um, the photographers will just crowd around, particularly the young women, of course, uh, out, out in the, um, when at Comicat they have a big porch that sort of people kind of flow out and they're just like surrounded by photographers, like 30, 5, 30 50, 40 <coughs> photographers lined around, you know, uh, like four girls or something like that. It's just, uh, it's, it's very different. And that's uh, the mostly how it's, the reception has changed. It's not so much the people in the anime convention, it's the uh, inclusion now of photographers who are there not for anime and manga, who are there for photography. It's the most radical difference, I think. You mentioned um, earlier today um, uh, about, I, I was talking about someone who made armor, and then you were talking about um, the mech costumes and the design community that has been created around mm -hmm. this. And I'm wondering if you could talk in a little more detail about um, sort of the, the different sorts of uh, design groups or individual designers that have to be involved to make this whole world work. One of the things I do in the book is talk about uh, a small group. I, um, I, I, I sort of lived with, in a way, a big group of 60 people. That was a big cosplay group uh, called Doom Squad. Um, a a, um, a medium-sized group called Nya, and they do panel uh, performances, right? They did kind of guest shows and stuff, and they got to be quite famous, and they were really funny. Um, and then a, a small group of four women called Versenworks. Um, and um, I chart what, how Versenworks puts things together. So there's kind of, uh, again, we have these categories. Um, the really hard-nosed, serious, conservative cosplayers. 
um, spend a lot of time working on their costumes uh, for the the different things that they're going to do. They make up their minds uh, they're with their troupe if they're performing with somebody else, and mostly that's the way it is now. Um, and they have, you know, weapons designers, guys in their troops who do just weapons, because you can't have, like, metal. It has to be out of plastic, right? Guys who do the armory, who do all of the mecha costumes, pieces, and so forth, and the mechanisms inside them. Um, people who do the electronics inside of, like, the dollars and stuff like that. Dollars don't exist as much here as they do in Japan. Dollars are are usually males who wear uh, uh, shoujo costumes and the entire headpiece is one thing. And they have slits in the eyes that they can see out of and they have a tiny microphone in here so that they can talk to their handler. They don't talk usually to other people. They talk through a handler who guides them through the con. So that's a very specific kind of a designer, right? So there are lots of people then who are seamstresses, the ones who, who choose the stuff. They usually work as a group designing these things. Um, and they have, because the uh, masquerade um, judging has gotten to be very extreme, like you know, looking at seams, you know, that kind of thing, and very exacting. And I think that's part of the reason why the cosplayers that are the hardcore cosplayers have become as hard-nosed as they are. Um, they have to be judged, and so the, everything has to be perfect. You know, they do the hair, they do everything. So I, um, to in the book, I, I go through uh, the whole process of one whole uh, performance from the beginning of it to the end with Versen Works. And you know, I sat with them while they were deciding what they were going to do, how they did it. Then one of the things that's great is is that uh, cosplayers, when they perform in Masquerade, they have to have their music all set up. And like uh, to, and if there's any dialogue, it has to be mastered in, right? Because it goes into a computer and into their number, and it comes on, and they have to perform, right? So it's like very quick, and they have to know the blocking really well. And of course, sometimes they don't know the dimensions of the stage. So there, it's a very complex thing. So they write the script, they figure out the music, they build the costumes, they start doing lip sync. Uh, exercises because one of the things that they also have to do when they have this recorded thing is that they have to match the lip flap, right? This is what uh, sound people do, right? So they learn to do that and when people live remotely, not in their town, they send it to them so that they can learn the lip flap, right? So that when they get together, they start rehearsing usually in the hallways and stuff like that or in the rooms and so forth, getting ready for this event. So it's a very complicated thing and that's for one because if they win anything, with that particular scene, they toss it and do another one for the next cosplay. And the cosplay season is all through the summer. So they usually have three or four different things ready to go by the time they, the season starts. It's intense. That was a lot of work. They made me work because I can sew. So here, you do that, right? Yeah, it's a lot of work and a lot of money, frankly. So a lot of money spent on it. Back there is the one. Um, in terms of anime and manga cosplay, um, would you consider um, the difficulties of having a concise or a general structure or meaning of cosplay? Um, uh, what's it called, like, having difficulties informing that, um, would it be because of social media and social media and web, um, web platforms um, having set parameters in, um, in groups, in, in many different groups? Um, I wonder if you can expand on that. Yeah, so the social media, so uh, one of the things that uh, cosplayers, particularly the ones who are serious do, there is an online um, organizing thing called Cure. It's Cure in English, it looks like Cure. And it's a massive registration. So if you're a cosplayer, no matter where you are in the world, you register with Cure. You get a number and you can put on your looks, right? 
in your thing so that people know who you are. When you meet people in Japan especially, they'll have books with all of their friends and a lot of the, all of their looks in a book so that you can look at their book and see all their different cosplay things. So social media plays a huge role in this. So that's just one element. Um, a lot of the photography gets um, shared through different um, sites as well. Um, and again, I think that there's a prioritized, I'm not as clear on this as, as I am about the other aspects of that, but I think that they, they do not allow their stuff to like go just into, you know, Google Images if they can help it, right? People will take pictures of things and then put them on themselves, but in terms of their professional photographs, they generally do not show up on Google Images. So Peggy Sims, her stuff is not on there. Um, people who have taken pictures of her in performance have small pictures, you know, from the stage, but her professional photography is something that they share because they sell it, right? It's, it's something that is a commodity now. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, uh, I think, uh, through the social media, they do link up a lot. I mean, that's how groups that live in different places get together. Um, they may, like, reform groups uh, over the season or uh, during the breaks, right, in the winter time. So basically, is that what you were asking? I'm sorry, people were leaving, so I couldn't hear all that you were talking about in the first. Like the difficult, um, you had said in the beginning, it's, it was hard to um, compile information about cosplay. And I was wondering if, if you think it's because of social media and, and the web platforms because they always talk if if they form a group they have certain parameters and right. another group will have one yes so, exactly yeah. well i think um i think that uh that they're uh finding out about anime and manga cosplay that kind of stuff is, is it can be easy to a certain extent on social media, but I think that there's a great deal that's held back um, because, of, in in essence, because it's either ha commodified in some way, you know, that somebody has to pay for it, access to these things, or because, in a sense, there's a way in which the more exclusive you are, the cooler you are, right? And so I know that Peggy is very careful about who takes pictures. She wouldn't let me take picture of her, right? Uh, but uh, and I, uh, so I just. You know, I didn't do that. Uh, so I didn't, uh, so you know, I think that that's, that's possibly true, that you know, that these things are sort of hard to find. A lot of these images I had to really dig uh, to find by going through different words, searches, and looking at those old co uh, conference pictures and so forth. And a lot of times people will put stuff on Pinterest. This is my pet peeve with no citation. That pisses me off because this is this marvelous picture I can't say is Karen Dick, but I think it's her, right? But they don't put down any citation. It drives me nuts because this is stuff that we, if they're meaning to share it, then cite it, right? It doesn't have to be a New York style or, you know, or Chicago style, or it doesn't have to be anything, right? Uh, but just put down who it is and the date and as much information, right? It so pisses me off that I can't find out, I can't verify anything, right? Yeah, did that answer your question? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, anyone else? Got time for one more. So I have one last burning question. Um, you've mentioned like how strict and invested those people are in their um, characters and cosplay. Um, how does that affect like their daily lives? Like, are they like totally different on like normal days, or like are they in characters and a little bit like that? Yeah. Um, okay. So in the um in the, group, the three groups that I worked with, uh, because none of them were that high caliber, uh, they, were, they had regular jobs. Many of them were students, some of them worked, um, but this was their, it's not, it, it, you know, I, I, I don't wanna call it a hobby, because this was their art. 
I mean, they take it extremely seriously. I mean, they joke around a lot, right? But this is deeply involved with their who they are as a person, who, their identity. Um, I was surprised to see what happens to identity in these things, uh, uh, watching them perform watching them hanging out with each other, how much flow of other they took on, released, took on another, released, and you know, using the sort of quotations from various anime, they would jump out of their character into the character associated with another anime because somebody else from that anime came up. They would then you know, go back and forth and so forth, and jumping in and out of identity is like crazy, right? Fascinating. Um, but this is an important thing to them. Uh, the Nya group uh, had a um, had a, a little falling out uh, with two sisters, and um, I don't think it was a big deal. But it was uh, like you know, th it just rattled everybody tremendously. Um, then there's another one, a picture I put in the book. Um, two of the members um, became romantic. Nobody else knew. So in the middle of a panel, and of course their panels are packed because they all are comedians, hilarious comedians, um, they, uh, they did dares, right? And one of the dares was to kiss, you know, it was set up, of course, to kiss, you know, the other, right? And did, you know, the deep dish, the, you know, the French kiss, you know, that took on, went for like, I don't know how long, and the, everybody went, oh my God, right? Because nobody knew, right? And there's, I have this great picture because I was standing behind them of, people doing this, right? Um, the crowd knows these people, right? So that they're, they come to see them every year. So that there are these personalities and so forth that are also involved with this kind of knowledge of you as this cosplay person, not as the regular person. So this gets tied up with identity in a way that uh, really helps you to understand the mutability and the multiplicity of identity of somebody. No one is one thing. We are all, uh, uh, lots of things, right? Um, I had a great Doctor Who quote about this. He said, well, I've been a lot of people in my day or something like that, right? Um, but we all are a lot of people in our days, you know, different people with different situations. But with this cosplay thing, when they enter the cosplay hotel, they just start flowing into this fan talk, I call it. It's like this a sort of a, a repartee of, of, uh, of dialogue with different anime, with people who they identify with, who, I, who, who are playing the same character or they're playing a different character or something. And so a lot of the jokes come with, you know, uh, doing farce relationships on this stuff. And this is particularly when they're in costume. When they're not in costume, it's not as bad. I mean, there's some of that, but it's not as bad. But when they get into costume, it's like they're crazy, right? So I sat on the floor against the wall and watched this stuff, right? Because if I was out of the way, they didn't see me. They would react differently because I'm vanilla, man. I'm telling you, I'm just vanilla as they come. So I'm sitting down there taking notes going, oh, my God, oh, my God, right? Because it's just fascinating to see. I had no idea how much performance is going on just hanging out in the cafeteria waiting for the masquerade, right? It's incredible, right? So it is very tied into identity, very tied into identity, so it's very important. They have their other jobs and they have relationships outside of cosplay, but when they're in cosplay, that's where they are, and that's what they do all summer long, is to do cosplay. Anyone else? Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming and um, being engaged with Asian studies and, and art on campus, and thank you very much to Dr. Lunning for sharing her knowledge with us today, and she'll be around tomorrow as well. Oh, and I, oh, I have uh, some handouts for her. Oh, uh, yes. I do a, a, a conference every a uh, year, the end of September, the last weekend in September. I have handouts for it. It's an academic conference, but everybody's invited, and it's in Minneapolis, and it's at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and so I have these sheets that if you want to, if you think you might want to come, it's more of the same kind of thing. Lots more dialogue and discussion and stuff like that, but I have pass outs. We also have a fashion show, which is uh, an amazing fashion show. We're part of Minnesota Fashion Week, and it's not just fashions, it's, um, it's, uh, you know, the, the edge fashions. It's all the sort of, you'll get Lolita's, you'll get 
cosplays, you'll get uh, people with just very eccentric uh, fashion. So um, if you want to do that, I have the handouts here. I'd be happy to give it to you um, with all the information about how to come in. Here, here's the phone, and I'm standing over here. Sorry, but if you have any questions also, you can always ask me, and um, I'll give you my, my email. You can always email me as well. So this is the Macademia Conference. Macademia Conference, and, yeah. and in end of September, um, and uh, also associated with a, a scholarly journal where yes. many of the presentations, papers yes. are published. And so those of you who are in the Art 300 read an article today for class um, on shoujo. Um, that came out of that, one of those. Yeah, out of one there's of those uh, the book series, which is volumes one through 10. We did um, in the past, uh, the, um, the publisher wanted to do a journal instead and wanted it twice a year. He wants me to die. Um, and so we're doing a journal twice a year, which means that we take rolling submissions. I don't care if you're not a PhD. Can you write? Are you interested in writing about this stuff? Send it to us. You never know, right? And usually if you ask me to give you a proof or a kind of crit on it, I'll do that, right? But for those of you who are uh, scholarly writers and so forth, this is a really great way to get things published, right? The first one comes out in, it's called uh, Macademia colon second arc, because it's our second arc, right? Um, and uh, the first topic was childhood because this is the beginning. Uh, I think the next one is transfer, a transnational fandom and the one after that is Asian materialities. And so those are the next ones. And so you can send a paper in any time for any of those, okay? And the full, um, I think we have like five out. There's a bunch of sci-fi ones coming up too. Um, so we're about five out in terms of the calls and so you can pick a call and, and do it now and for something that gets done you know, a couple of years from now. So yeah, so do that, that'd be great. And let me get those papers out for you.